Another type of loading that we need to have an appreciation of as engineers is cyclic loading. And cyclic loading causes fatigue. All we mean by cyclic loading is loading, unloading, loading, unloading. And that can be repeated for any number of cycles. On our graph in the top left hand corner, we see that the X axis is labelled as number of cycles. And this is a logarithmic scale. We've got 10 to the 0, which is 1, 10 to the 1, which is 10. 10 squared is 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, and so on. So that's the number of cycles of loading and unloading. A good example of where this might occur is on the wing of an aircraft. As a result of turbulence, we end up with cyclic loading on the wing, where the stress is on, the stress is off, and so on. Now on the other axis, we have the stress amplitude. Now much the same as with creep, the size of the stress or the amplitude of the stress here on our y-axis is going to directly impact on the number of cycles that can be done before failure. Now what we see labelled on here is our ultimate tensile strength. And if we refer to our stress strain graph for complex aluminium bronze, that's the stress value up here where the material fails. In this case, it's just over 700 megapascals. So what we see on our SN curve for cyclic loading is that at that value, at that stress value, we can only achieve one cycle. And that's exactly as we would expect. If we hit 700 megapascals for one cycle, then we would expect the material to fail. At lower stress values, the number of cycles that can be achieved increases. So at around 500 megapascals on our stress strain graph here, we know that we're into plastic deformation. And if we were to find a similar value on our SN curve, then that would dictate the number of cycles that can be achieved. Now typically, high cycle fatigue is defined as number of cycles above 10 to the 4 or 10,000. And anything less is considered low cycle fatigue. So what we're really saying there is that if the stress value is high, we have low cycle fatigue because the number of cycles that can be achieved is low. And if we have low stress values, we have high cycle fatigue because the number of cycles that can be achieved is high. If we were to take our stress value of 200 megapascals, where we're into elastic deformation, not plastic deformation, then we could probably assume that that would give us high cycle fatigue rather than low cycle fatigue. The number of cycles would be greater than with plastic deformation. Now the other thing that we see labelled on here is finite life and infinite life. And what we notice is that at very low stress values, we can assume that the piece of material is going to have an infinite life, meaning it can be stressed and strained for an infinite number of cycles. So providing the stress value is low enough, cyclic loading or fatigue becomes less of an issue. But as the stress increases, we can see that it becomes more of an issue. Now it is important to point out that the SN curve that we're looking at here has just been produced for representation purposes and this would vary depending on the material being used. But what this serves to highlight is that although stress strain data from a UTS test is important, it's also important to consider other parameters such as the number of cycles that the piece of material or the component is going to experience.